Harbor in here in just a minute. So what I've been playing with this week is this idea of start right where you are. And I know that, that probably you don't do this, but I do this, where I say to myself, well, as soon as, <laughs> as soon as this happens, then I will. As soon as I know what's going to happen, I'll feel more secure. <laughs> as soon as I'm sure, I'll have a little faith. As soon as you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you back. <laughs> as soon as I have a little extra, I'll be generous. As soon as the economy changes, I'll have the job that I want to. I'll start that business that I've always wanted to start. As soon as gas prices go down, I'll take a drive up in the mountains as soon as. And what I realize is that when I do that, I spend my life waiting for as soon as. And I, I don't know that as soon as ever comes. Because even when things happen that I said in the past, as soon as that happens, I have a brand new as soon as. <laughs> And so I'm always looking into the future for what I want to do, almost as if I have to have some outside circumstance give me, Barbara Waterhouse, permission to do what it is I want to do, or to do what I think I should do. Not from some outside should, but you know from that inner should, that part of me that's a little clearer, that part of me that's a little more sure that all is well and so it's okay to go ahead and step out in faith and do that. It's almost as if I have to have something give me permission, but then the weird neurotic game is that I always keep that permission a step away because I always have a new as soon as. And so I think what a waste of time that is. Ernest Holmes tells us to start right where we are. And I've played with that idea because if I want to go from here out the door, some of you may be thinking, boy, I really want to go out that door. <laughs> no, this is good for you. You stay here. <laughs> if I want to go from here out the door and I'm pretending that I'm somewhere other than right here, or I'm thinking that as soon as I'm over at that first row of chairs, then I'll go out the door, what happens is it keeps me frozen where I am. I can't ever get out the door unless I start right where I am. So I can either give myself, an, as soon as I'm at that first row of chairs, or as soon as I'm at the back row of chairs, then I'll go out the door, always wondering why I'm still standing here on the stage. Or if I say, well, I'll tell everybody that I'm a little more advanced than I am. I'll tell everybody that I'm a little closer to my goal than I am, and then I can pretend to go out the door. The thing is, is we're never going to get out the door unless we start right where we are. We're never going to have our lives take change unless we start where we are. It's impossible. And some people come into this teaching and we say, turn away from the condition, focus on that which you want, don't whine and tell the story, don't sob, sob story yourself, focus on what you want, create that reality, change your past, have a happy childhood, go out the door but you still have to start right where you are. You have to take this step. And it doesn't mean that you go around and lie about what's going on in your life. Do you know that this Center for Spiritual Living is one of the biggest support systems you'll ever have? And there are some people who, whenever things get a little rocky, they, they run and hide. They think that it's not okay to be here. There's an illusion that says you can only be here if you're healthy. God forbid you should come in here and sneeze and let someone say, well, what's in your consciousness that you have congestion? And Denise Hay says that's confusion. Or you can only come here if you've got X amount of dollars. I've heard tell that this is the, the church for rich people. My mouth, God's ears. <laughs> if you're driving a Mercedes or a Jag or, or a Porsche, where's Doug? Doug brings the Porsche to the, the parking lot. Or, or something like that. And if, you're, if your car has you know, uh, got a dead battery or something that you can't come in, how crazy is that? Because this is the place where we change the consciousness 
that has us, that allows us to have the things in life that we have an idealized image of what it would take to be an acceptable part of this community. This is where you get it, but you got to start here. you got a dead battery, don't worry. Somebody will go out and they'll do a spiritual mind treatment, and your car will spring to life. <laughs> we have done it on numerous occasions. If you need something in your life, we have the support system to say, we can stand in consciousness and create that with you, and in the meantime, we can deal with what's going on that you haven't had it up until now. We can plant ideas inside of you. This is, of course, anything is possible. You are God in form as you. And yet some people say, as soon as things change, then I'll do that. As soon as such and such happens, I'll do that. I'll be okay. I'll have this kind of life. And I want to really encourage you to let it be okay where you are. Emerson said that there comes a point in everyone's life when they realize that envy is ignorance, and imitation is suicide. So if you think that there's anybody else that's got it more together than you, let me assure you, you are as good as it gets. <laughs> You're as good as it gets. You are God in form as you. This is it. And so we take our creation. I mean, sometimes people come into my office and I marvel at their power. You have managed to be poor in an abundant universe. You have so much power that you can hold back the windows of heaven. And you can create a life that is so out of sync with what is that it looks real. And you're trying to convince me of it. Sitting in my office trying to get me to buy in. And what I know is that God is all that there is and that you are God in form and that you have everything that you want out of life and that you can change that in a moment. Just because we close our eyes does not mean we are not here. <laughs> Just because we turn off the light doesn't mean that we have conquered light with darkness. No, all we did was turn off the light and anybody can go over and flip the switch and turn the light back on. The light is always here. And yet we look at ourselves and say, oh, if only, if only I had been born with a silver spoon in my mouth. That is a quote going out on the news shows right now from our beloved president saying that his opponent was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and so was his wife, born with a silver spoon in her mouth. And I thought, what a concept. Well, if I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, then I would be safe, be loving, be kind. I would take risks. Oh, if only I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Meaning, if I had everything handled that I think, because people are under the illusion that money is what they want. It's not the money. Get shipwrecked on a deserted island with a, a big treasure chest filled with gold and cash, it's not going to help you. A coconut would be helpful. A machete would be great. How about a big lighter? Whoa, that'd be fantastic. It's not the money, it's what we think money is going to give us. So, oh, if I had been born with a guarantee in this life that everything was going to work out, then I could be who I have come here to be. If I had been born with a silver spoon in my mouth, then I would practice these principles of prosperity that Barbara and John talk about. So I wonder where the silver spoon came from. Silver spoon in my mouth only means that my wealth in my family is generational. And so where did it start? Well, if I was a Rockefeller. So I looked up John D. Rockefeller Sr., the one who started all of this. And the interesting thing is that he was not born wealthy. He was born of meager means. The first year that he worked, he made a whopping $95. But what he did is he didn't wait until he had great wealth to share it. And so he took $9.50 during that year and he tithed it to his church. He did that. He kept very good records about what happened to his money and he always tithed on his income. Now it only took him 15, I'm not saying 5-0, I'm saying 15 years before he was able to put 
50 million dollars into what we know now as the Rockefeller Foundation. 15 years of not waiting, but of starting right where he is. And by the, by the time he made his transition, he had given over half of all of his wealth away. And so we say, well, when that job comes in, when that uh, uh, lottery winning comes in. People say that. Oh, treat for me to win this lottery on this ticket and then I'll tithe to the center. And I'm thinking if you're not tithing right now, you're not going to tithe when you win the lottery. And chances are you're not going to win the lottery because you don't have a consciousness of prosperity and abundance. That starts right where we are. We're never going to be more loving than we are now. And if we hold on to our love until we make that person suffer enough, <laughs> until they apologize for what they did, we're never going to have that experience of love. you got to start right where you are, no matter what they're doing. No matter what someone says to you, no matter how upset it makes you, that's all about you. They may be pushing your button, but they did not install it. It's your button. <laughs> so if they're pushing your button, don't get mad at them. Look at yourself and say, wow, how did I get a button like that? <laughs> Do I want to keep it? I'm going to go to that Center for Spiritual Living and figure out how to get rid of it. Don't wait. Don't wait another moment to live your life. You don't need anything more than you have right now. For that matter, in this now moment, you have everything. You have every answer. You have every solution. You may not know where it's going to come from. And you may not even know what this next step holds for you. We have this funny way of thinking. We'll see something on the news and we'll say, oh, well, you know, they, that, they, they are that kind of a person. And so if I were that kind of a person, I'd be doing that thing too. But I'm not. And the truth is that everybody who ended up as that kind of a person started out just like us. There's a guy named Larry Page. And he just started out as a regular kid. His parents were teachers. And he was fascinated with how things worked. So he was the kid that took the clocks apart, the flashlights apart, the radios apart, the toaster apart. He kept taking everything apart. He didn't say, once I get to run Google and become a bazillionaire, then I will satisfy my creative urges, take risks, go far beyond the, the socioeconomic level of my parents. He decided to do it as a regular, normal kid. There's a guy named James Cameron. Perhaps you've heard of him now that the Titanic has been re-released. Re James Cameron dropped out of high school to drive a truck. He didn't say, once I am this famous filmmaker, I'm going to stop being bored in high school. He didn't say, I'm going to take a risk once I've got all of my money lined up. He said, high school's not for me. I know there's something better. And if I have to drive a truck, I'll do that. And when he wasn't driving a truck, he was at the university library reading people's papers on special effects and lighting. He didn't wait till he had a job. He just went for it. And there was a guy named Charles Simono. He was born in Budapest. When he was in high school, he needed a job. So he took a job in with the Soviets watching as a night watchman guarding one of their supercomputers. And he got fascinated with computers. He became the chief architect of Microsoft with Bill Gates. And then there's this guy named Ross Perot Jr. Now, granted, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. But his father wasn't. His father went to a junior college, and then he got into the Naval Academy. And his father is known not only for running for president, but as, as having had the biggest individual loss ever on the stock exchange, where his shares dropped 
$450 million in one day. In one day, he lost $450 million. And he created a wealth that lasted for generations. So perhaps you saw on Good Morning America or on the news that Larry Page, Eric Schmidt, James Cameron, and Charles Simonil and Ross Perot Jr. are planning to take over the space program. Yeah. It's fascinating that right after the shuttle made its final journey to the museum, these guys announced that they're going to take over the space program and they're going to mine asteroids. They said there are, there are things on asteroids that we've never even seen yet. And how can you put a value on that? He said it's not even worth, they said it's not even worth billions or trillions. There are things that we don't even know about yet. And so they're going to mine asteroids. Well, I would mine asteroids if I had been <laughs> the top of you know, Google and the chief architect of Microsoft. And if Ross Perot was my dad, I'd mine asteroids. If I'm not doing something out of the box right now, I never will. You've got to be willing to risk. You've got to be willing to step out. You've got to be willing to follow your passion, even if that means that you're dropping out of school, that you're playing with a Soviet supercomputer in occupied Budapest, and you're a high school kid. You've got to be willing to go for what excites you and what uplifts you. And when you do that, you find that you change your world and you change everybody's world because you have something special in you. And you may not know what it is. It doesn't come with a lot of guarantees. And have you noticed that it doesn't come with a 10-year plan? <laughs> it's just something that excites you, something that you feel drawn to, something that you intuitively get that this is yours to do. And then the question is, are you going to do that or are you going to say, as soon as my uh, 401k comes back up in value, as soon as the feeling in my knee starts to go away, as soon as I find my true love, as soon as I win that lottery, as soon as that happens, I'll do it. And what I know is that if you're not willing to do it today, chances are very high you never will be. And so I want to encourage you to do it, whatever it is. What is it? What is it? You want to go to Peru? Tony's in Peru. Sabrina's back there running sound. Thank you, Sabrina, because Tony went to Peru. Yay! What do you want to do? Oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. If you have the desire for it, the fulfillment of that desire already exists. And all you need to do is stay clear and watch it show up in form. What is it that is yours to do? It doesn't have to be a big deal. There's a guy named Sugata Mitra who lives in India. And he had a lovely job. He was in a, a high-rise building. And if you saw Slumdog Millionaire, right on the other side of a very tall wall was Slumdog Millionaire. It was the, the, the uh, deep um, ghettos of India. And he had this idea, because he was playing with computers, and he said, I wonder what would happen if I exposed these ghetto children to computers. And so it's called the hole in the wall. He cut a hole in the wall. He stuck a computer in there. And he stuck a little pad that they could work on, made it so that nobody could steal it. He put a camera up there, and he went away. And what he noticed was that children who had no education, who had never seen a computer, who had no idea what the internet was, was hooked up to the internet, and who didn't speak English, figured out in a matter of hours how, you, how to work it and how to get on the web. And then those same children turned around and they taught their friends. They didn't hoard the knowledge. They taught their friends, hey, Senga. <laughs> And they started teaching their, their friends how to get online in a language they didn't know. And so they looked at that and they said, oh, maybe this is just a, a coincidence. And so they said, let's go to a really, really, really poor section of India where nobody knows anything. Nobody's ever taught anybody anything there. 
and let's try it. And so they took the computer there and they made it more difficult. They said to the children who did not speak English, who had never seen a computer, who had no idea what bioengineering was, and had never heard of the internet, they said, there is some very difficult information on this computer. You probably won't be able to figure it out. <laughs> and they went away for two months. And when they came back, they said, did you learn anything? And one girl raised her hand and she said, the only thing we really learned is that when genes mutate, they tend to cause blah, 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 blah. But, you know, a lot of that stuff we never even, we, we didn't, just didn't understand at all. They tested them at that moment, and they were equal to school children. They left the computer there for two more months and tested them again, and they were equal to the high school students in the finest schools in New Delhi. Now, all he wanted to do was see whether or not kids could figure out how to work a computer. He didn't know that it would bring about global change. The global change that it brought about, about was one laptop per child. And in April of 2010, 15 million laptops went to children in sub-Saharan Africa. All he wanted to do was cut a hole in the wall stick a computer on the other side, bolt it down very securely, and see what would happen. And what he found out was that people, people are all the same. It doesn't matter whether you've eaten, it doesn't matter what kind of clothing you have, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter whether you know the language, people are all the same and there's something very special in every one of us. There's a story about a man that I have loved for a good year. It's nothing, nothing personal, John. <laughs> His name is Salman Khan. And he had cousins who lived in a different city. He, he lived in Boston. His cousins lived in New Orleans. And his cousins needed help in school. So he said, okay, I'll set up a camera and I'll tutor you in your schoolwork. And then I'll send you the, the videos and you can watch them and you can get tutored because I've already been through college and I know all of these. These were younger kids that needed help. And so he did that. And then he said, well, you know, I might as well put these up on YouTube and maybe somebody else would like to watch them. One of the things that he had to deal with was that his cousins liked him on a video better than in person. <laughs> because on a video, they could stop and rewind and get what he said. On a video, they could fast forward and not be bored. If they forgot what he said the week before, there was no embarrassment, they'd just go to the week before video and play it again. And so he made these videos for his cousins, just starting right where he was, to do something that would help his cousins out. He put them up on YouTube, thinking maybe somebody would want to watch them. In three years, there were 50,000 views per month on his tutoring videos for his cousins. In four years, there were 200,000 views per month for his tutoring videos. In five years, there were a million views per month for these videos. In the summer of 2011, which was nine months ago, there were two million views a month. Now I love these guys because these are the videos that the children in our Light of Wisdom school use to study math and science. Since then, he's made 2,200 videos put together by the best of the best to take a child anywhere from two plus two equals four to quantum mechanics. They've all been translated into 10 different languages and they're about to go into what's called a crowdsource translation, which means people take it and they translate it into their own uh, dialect, into a language that they know. And they do it all by themselves. They don't have to be registered or anything like that. And then they post it all back translated into a new language. He said that when they finish that, that it's reasonable to think that there will be billions 
of views a month. Wow. Wow. A month. He was just doing what was in front of him. He wasn't waiting to be famous. He had cousins who needed help. So he said, I know this stuff. I'll make a videotape of it, and I'll send it to you. Oh, I might as well put it up on YouTube. And then look what happened. He just contracted with the Los Altos School District to have all the children in Los Altos take their math and science classes on what's called Khan Academy. And inside of 12 weeks, the student exam scores doubled. Doubled. Why? Because it's easier to learn when there's not a pressure of, I didn't quite understand it, could you go, go back and say that again? Or, I know this, I want to fast forward into something new. It's easier to learn when you can go back over something that someone said a couple of months ago and get it again without having to feel stupid like some children do in classes. One little boy was inter interviewed, he's 13, and he said, wow, this is like playing a game. <laughs> Who knows what greatness is within you? The only way you're ever going to know is to let it out. The only way you're ever going to, to really stretch this experience called life is to begin acting as if it's already here. It's already in you. You don't have to wait for something to change. You don't have to wait for economies or businesses or politics or relationships or finances to change for you to be who you are meant to be. The only time you're ever going to do it is now. Because the only time that there is, is now. It brings me back to Ramdas. Be here now. And who you are is more than good enough. You don't have to copy anybody. You don't have to compare yourself to anybody because they've got their own brilliance. They've got their own greatness. They've got their own genius. And the fact that you don't see it is perfectly appropriate. It's theirs. The only one you have to pay attention to is yours. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do today to begin living your life now? To stop waiting for something else to happen. To stop living your life waiting for permission from some outside source that says it's okay for you to be brilliant. It's okay for you to be fantastic. It's okay for you to change your world, and in so doing, change our world. And so it is.